Great. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us for this uh, fourth part of four for the Sustainable Buildings for All Incentive Framework uh, webinar series. Um, today, uh, your hosts will be myself and Ante Woolen. So my name is Amanda Ingmeyer. I'm an architect and senior policy analyst at DEQ, where I co-lead our built environment program. Um, and Ante, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Ante Volen, a sustainability strategist at Glumac, a sustainable MEP firm in, based in Portland, West Coast, and very excited to hear about what these amazing practitioners in Oregon have been doing in this area. Awesome, thanks Ante. Um, so as uh, you may be aware for folks who are uh, just attending for the first time, um, this part four, we're gonna be hearing as Ante said from um, the amazing practitioners on screen who are gonna share their case studies of projects that were featured in the Sustainable Buildings for All um, framework report um, and are achieving these high levels of performance in sustainability and equity um, that SB4A was really looking for. So I'm really excited today to welcome um, Alex Boatzel from Greenhammer, uh, Jennifer Nye and Jake Lewis from Salazar Architect and Mark Bruni from PAE. Um, and so as you see on the screen here, this is the Sustainable Buildings for All Incentive Framework. Um, both a report as well as a summary document uh, were published earlier this year. And um, I will drop the link in, a chat, in the chat in just a moment. Um, that will take you to where these documents live as well as all of the recordings for these webinars. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I also just want to uh, make sure that we acknowledge all the many, many folks who contributed to this work. Um, there are a lot of experts and advocates and, and folks in the room in the built environment um, who made this possible. Uh, many, many of them are on the call today. Um, so we're excited to hear from them. Um, and just one last kind of housekeeping thing, and then I'll turn it over to Ante to do a bit of an introduction. Um, we will take questions um, throughout the presentation if they're really relevant to a, a point we're on. Um, we'll make sure to kind of bring those to the speaker directly. Um, but we'll also be saving questions for the end as well so we can have um, a great Q&A with all of our panelists. Um, so anytime throughout the presentations, feel free to drop those in the chat or the Q&A um, and we will make sure to get to them. Um, so with that, Ante, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, so this is our, our fourth in this series of Sustainable Buildings for All uh, webinars where we've been talking about the how, the where, the what um, of this, these kinds of incentive ideas. And, and as a reminder that this idea was that through the built environment, we have great opportunities to affect three key issue areas, uh, the climate and how human, humans are gonna respond to that crisis. Uh, how are we gonna do better on the issues of equity and racial justice? And then how do we ensure that the buildings that we are producing are still promoting the health of both humans and the environment? And it's part of the reason this process got started many years ago is we realized we just had a, a wealth of intellectual knowledge and passion on these issues here in Portland, Oregon. And so it's great to, to be here today with these designers who have helped produce projects that, that walk the walk in these areas. So Sustainable Buildings for All is uh, to reward and, and encourage projects to do these things, um, comes up with a set of tiers and of a, for a range of performance, and then it relies heavily on third-party certifications to document that performance. Um, but because many existing rating systems don't speak very well to some of the equity concerns in our community, we've added in, in this draft version, uh, equity specific requirements. And the goal is that ultimately we're driving performance that there's a, asp that a aspirational level at tier four that gets more and more challenging, but more and more impactful as you move up in these tiers and that project should be incentivized accordingly for what they achieve. We'll speak quickly to these summaries, these, these achievements and, and the requirements, and you'll start hearing some of these things come up from our speakers today. Um, but at, at the right-hand side, there's this tier four of where we start seeing LEED certified or Earth Advantage Platinum buildings that incorporate significant reductions in energy demand, some mandatory credits to make sure that we're keeping those green building benefits balanced across all of those buckets. 
and then moving further up to higher levels of certification, um, some more rigorous certification programs, where at maybe the ultimate end, you end up with a living building, the idea of a project that generates as much energy as it uses, has reduced its own embodied carbon, has offset its carbon, and is, is just a much more sustainable building. Um, these are some of those specific metrics. So as we're hearing people talk today about their projects, you might be able to understand where they spot in to these buckets, addressing both energy efficiency at one side and renewable energy in increasing amounts and then ultimately embodied carbon as we get to higher performance tiers. And then getting into some of these equity requirements. Um, it, this is a, is a major, you know, pulling a few of the levers that are available in the building sector about uh, COVID that's, you know, sometimes called disadvantaged businesses, but minority and women-owned businesses, how, what percentage of participation are they getting in the project? Um, looking at affordability and inclusion and how what that could mean for both residential and commercial projects. And then looking at community engagement. How are these projects um, interacting with the community, reflecting the needs and, and the hopes of the community that they are located in? These are things that uh, exist outside of that rating system framework because they're, they're a little more progressive, but sorely needed. And then the incentives. So we talk about, um, again, with those tier stepped incentive approach that tier four, you're getting some additional floor area ratio allowance to your project. You might be getting height bonus, this idea that you would kind of be paying lower systems development charges based on proportional to kind of the impact that you're having, that there's some ability that the local governments could assist in either expediting or, or hands-on assisting permitting. And then looking to other zoning requirements that might be relevant to help these projects make their sustainable goals. And the goal is that with the highest level of performance, you would get a higher incentive. So today we're gonna to be hearing from our uh, project leaders about how they both have already tackled some of these issues and then they'll start to see how maybe these incentives could or, could or be useful to future projects. Uh, the other thing that is included here is penalties. Uh, this is inspired by how the city of Seattle is dealing with this for their similar programs, but the idea that for there is a, a clawback of up to 5% of your construction value for projects that don't follow through on these requirements. And we've added some, some weighing here to just break that out so that it's not always 5% um, and that a project that got very close wouldn't have to take that full brunt. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. Jennifer from Salazar Architects to talk about their project in Northeast Portland. Okay. One second here. So um, good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Nye with Salazar Architects. I'm an associate principal and um, I have with me today Jake Lewis who will be answering any technical questions, especially about Earth Advantage. Um, Los Angeles is a project that has really excelled in the equity side of the, of the rating system. So um, Uh, Los, Los Adelitas is a new affordable housing project. It sits on the site of a former strip club that was known for human trafficking and prostitution. Um, the project is a collaboration between Hacienda, CDC, Living Cully, and Verde with early project support from Habitat of Humanity of Portland, Craft 3, and Prosper Portland. The general contractor, LMC Construction, provided guidance throughout the design process and has been a great project partner throughout. Salza Architects was founded in 2007 and established Portland office in 2015. Los Adelitas was really the first major project the firm um, has done in Portland. <clears throat> we are a minority owned business and our work is often in service of low income families and individuals, as well as migrant and immigrant communities. Our team is multicultural and represents several countries of origin and first languages. We aim to provide culturally appropriate engagement without language barriers whenever possible. We are working to advance our organization towards equity, inclusion, and anti-racism, toward our vision of a design firm whose social mission is reflected equally in its internal culture and external work. 
The Las Adelitas project is one of, is in a once neglected part of the Colleen neighborhood. It was bordered by busy streets and a low scale building <clears throat> buildings. Cully is a majority low income neighborhood and is highly racially and eth ethnically diverse. The neighborhood includes heavy, heavy industrial land uses in the northern section, a state highway, and a few and few community services within walking distance. In 2010, Living Cully was established by an innovative collaboration between Habitat of for Humanity of Portland, Hacienda, the Native American Youth and Family Service. Family Center and Verde. The collaboration works to improve the quality of life for people of color and low-income people of the Cully neighborhood, ensuring that Cully will always be a place where people of color and low-income people live and thrive. In 2015, Living Cully purchased the project site. Shortly after the purchase, the first community design workshops were held around the design of the exterior space. The workshops helped educate and empower the community while developing future leaders. Several of the participants remained engaged throughout the design evolution and were present at the groundbreaking of the project in March of 2021. In 2016, Living Coley explored reusing the existing building in an effort to revitalize the block and build sustainably. Ultimately, the renovation was deemed cost prohibitive with a significant amount of money being needed to spend spent on upgrades to the exterior design to meet the current Portland zoning standards. By 2017, Hacienda took the lead on the site, envisioning a large mixed use development that could support their housing and social enterprise goals. And for those who don't know, Hacienda has a large campus in this area of affordable housing and their headquarters building right across the street. So in 2017, concept, the concept plan included two buildings linked by a street level plaza and parking area. At the time, the project was proposed as four over one construction with, with podium amenity decks for residents. The community design workshops continued in 2018 with a focus on colors, textures, streetscape design, the plaza, and community hall. Workshop participants included Hacienda residents, the broader Coley neighborhood residents, and local business owners. The community highlighted the need for a mid-block crossing on Killingsworth, ultimately leading to a large, larger project coordinated with Peabody. While the project struggled to win financing, the city implemented zoning code changes. In 2019, the D overlay was removed from the site, opening up design opportunities, but the allowable height was reduced from 55 feet to 45 feet. The team refined the design approach and drew inspiration more directly from vernacular buildings and modernist architects such as Lake Aretta and Baragon. An accentuated parapet at the corner anchors the key intersection of the neighborhood, while a mural highlights the eastern corner and gateway to the plaza site. In late 2019, additional community workshops were held with Hacienda residents, focusing on the interiors of the building. Feedback from the residents influenced interior finishes, selections, including casework, flooring, and paint colors. The final site plan includes a large public plaza facing Killingsworth, an interior secured park um, courtyard for residents, including playground seating, picnic tables, and a movie wall. The eastern portion of the site is left for future community serving commercial development, ideally including a daycare and healthcare uses. Nearing completion, the project is now a three over one construction, has 141 affordable units plus one manager's unit. It includes permanent 18 per permanent supportive housing units, community room for residents, a Nino's classroom for parent parenting classes, and a community hall for broader Hacienda community. Influenced by the community design process, the plaza incorporates an organic shaped planter beds, built-in seating, festival lighting, and a stage area. <clears throat> Currently, the project is on target for LEED Platinum. The original goal was LEED Gold, or excuse me, Earth Advantage Platinum and Earth Advantage Gold. Um, being adjacent to highway and industrial uses, the project team prioritized indoor air quality and cooling early in the project. 
The pro and currently includes central ducted fresh air and mini split heating and cooling systems. The project also incorporates a digital focused EV charging program, building on the lessons learned from earlier car sharing program challenges that the, at the Hacienda campus. <clears throat> Not under construction yet, but designed and um, hopefully going through permitting. The project includes a large solar array for community solar covering nearly the entire rooftop. <clears throat> so based on the use of the Earth Advantage system, most of the tier one through three credits were not achievable for the project. The project did score well in the equity and racial justice goals which were the priority of the project from its inception. As an affordable housing project, <clears throat> uh, the project was already able to take advantage of significant SDC waivers in Portland. Additional incentives that could have helped the project include additional height, the existing 45 foot height limit constrains the units and additional height could have helped improve the quality of daylight within the residential units. A second, um, item that could have helped the project is a steam, streamlined priority processing for zoning adjustments to address the ground floor garage use would have been beneficial. Although parking is not required for the community for the project, the community was clear in engagement workshops that there was a significant need for parking. Many of the residents work far from Kelly or work out off hours, making transit unrealistic for some of the residents. So to wrap it up, I have a few additional renderings and photos we wanted to share. First is the entry area, which includes a generous welcoming lobby that provides views through the lobby to the interior courtyard. A wood accents the entry wall and, it, and interior benches soften the street presence and create a sense of warmth and home. Within the interior courtyard, a series of small play pods distribute the playground along the length of the courtyard, intermixed with a variety of seating and landscape beds. And this is just a construction progress photo of the courtyard. And then the community hall is a space designed to hold larger events for the Hacienda community, such as presentations, cooking classes, community and private celebrations like quinceaneras. And another progress photo. And last, um, recently com completed is the mural Together We Bloom, which celebrates the neighborhood's cultural diversity and strength. Additional commissioned art and non-commissioned art is integrated throughout the interior of the project, including an interior mural to be um, installed in November. And that is it for the Las Adelitas project. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, and so we will hand it over to Mark next to present on PAE. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, let me make a couple of adjustments here and try to get my screen shared. Everyone see a PAE slide now? Yes, so that has the just label um, kind of on the bottom left. Yep, yep, exactly. All right. Um, yeah, well, thanks everybody for being here. My name is Mark Rooney. I'm a mechanical engineer and principal at PAE. Um, for those of you that maybe don't know PAE, uh, we're a mechanical, electrical, plumbing, lighting, technology, design, uh, engineering firm. Uh, on the West Coast, five offices, about 350 people. Um, our headquarters is in Portland. We've been in business here in Portland for 55 years. And um, last year, I completed uh, a headquarters for, for ourselves in, in, um, in town here uh, as a five-story, um, fully intended to be fully certified living building. So the PA living building, uh, 58,000 square feet. It's in downtown Portland. I'm sitting in it right now. Uh, at First and Pine. And um, the, the Living Building Challenge, if you're not familiar with it, is you know you have to go through a performance period and actually prove that you can meet all the requirements of the Living Building Challenge. Uh, we are about to enter into our performance period. It's been a year, we've kind of been uh, in the, um, the warm-up phase, I guess, of 
uh, shaking everything out and making sure the building's working the way you need it to be working. Um, so yeah, so under it's full uh, ILO 5 version 3.1 living building certified. Uh, the intent is then with that, you know, net positive energy. So we'll, uh, we'll be generating all of the energy for the building with the rooftop array that you see uh, in this slide and an additional offsite array. And we'll talk about a little bit more to capture all the rainwater off of the roof of the building, store that in a cistern. That's the drinking water. It gets recycled to gray water for toilets and, uh, you know, and, um, and then all of the waste from the toilets is actually captured in composters and a fertilizer system. So we're trying to close that nutrient cycle, cycle as well. Uh, the building is built to category four for structure. So uh, the intent is that it is, you know, um, going to be largely undamaged after the, uh, you know, whenever the Cascadia earthquake uh, hits the West Coast, then uh, the bones of this building and the carbon and everything that's in it uh, you know, we're going to be able to last through that so the building will have a very long life cycle. 500 years is how we're trying to think of it. And then finally, uh, the, the project is, uh, we think the only living building that has been um, developed or led is how we're calling it. So it's the, the financial model to get this building to work was the same sort of financial model as, as any for-profit developer goes through. We, um, had to go out and solicit investors who wanted to be part of uh, this project. They expected a return, and we had a very tight, um, sort of typical developer pro forma that we had to hit to make this project actually work and really get it off the ground. Uh, so, taking you inside the building, and I said we were in Old Town Portland. Uh, the art in our lobby, we tried to really, um, you know, honor the the fact that. Old Town Portland is, you know, has been here for 170 years, and Native Americans have been on site for much, much longer, probably more than 10,000 years. Uh, and so we, we commissioned artwork uh, from a local indigenous artist. His name is Toma Villa. He did this carving that you see here. It's a seven-foot diameter carving of, um, I think of it as one of his ancestors coming out of the waters of the Columbia River Gorge. And um, paying tribute to the winds of the gorge and renewable energy that's produced there now and the renewable energy that powers buildings like the PA. Uh, it's, it's a really powerful piece as you come in the lobby and a great way to sort of every morning as you walk in, um, you know, remember, uh, remember the land that you're on and that uh, you know, has a much richer history than you know, that is apparent, I guess, when you're in front of the uh, Moving up so that, you know, it is an office building. It's, uh, so this is our entrance lobby um, where our 200 employees here in Portland work. Uh, the floor is a radiant floor system, so a very efficient HVAC system. Uh, the windows that you can see here are operable, they automatically open and close to try and get natural ventilation into the space. Uh, the wood is all FSC certified, which is a requirement of the Living Building Challenge. Um, and, you know, all of this contributes to just a space that people want to be in. Um, so, you know, our employees get the benefit of sort of the, the biophilic nature of the wood of the windows. Uh, now in our post-pandemic age where you know we're in a time where we need to have office spaces that are better than people's homes and can entice people actually to get into the office. And that was a lot of what we were trying to think about as we were doing this. And some of that plays into the project financials and how we thought about this to make it work. Um, the building itself cost about 25% of premium over you know what a baseline code minimum building would have been. So it was about $435 a square foot hard costs for us to build this, this project. Uh, and so, you know, a substantial premium, but we made that work through a, a number of different things. So uh, the first is a living building. You know, we didn't know if we could make that uh, developer pro forma really work. And so one of the big moves that we did was the design team invested equity into the project. So instead of you know sending a bill and being paid in dollars, 
we sent a bill and we paid the shares of this building. What that did is eliminate the early risk for the developer to try and figure out, can we actually make a living building pencil and you know, get the return that our investors need, or is the project not going to work? And uh, so PAE, CGF designer, uh, the design architect, uh, Walsh, our contractor, our um, real estate agent, and Eadland Co, our developer, all sort of invested their fees as equity in the building that, that helped get things going. Uh, the project is in, in an opportunity zone, which helps increase the returns for uh, for our investors, some of, which, some of whom could sort of um, save on some capital gains because of the opportunity zone. Uh, the investor return is about a 10% return. Uh, that was what we needed to get to be able to get people actually interested in investing in the project and make it happen. PAE uh, committed as an anchor tenant, so we committed to three floors of the building. Uh, the building at this point now is about 85% leased out, which post-pandemic, I think, really speaks highly of living buildings and the draw, at least for mission-aligned organizations. So PAE is in here now, the New Buildings Institute, Earth Advantage, uh, Edlin and Co., and Beneficial State Bank for all tenants uh, in the building. Beneficial State Bank is a B Corp certified um, uh, local bank. Um, and then the, the low interest rates at the time when we were doing this project also helped make all of it come together and work. Uh, from PAE standpoint, we pay about a 10% premium for uh, our lease in, in this building. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a higher than class A lease. Um, at the same time, the building's 85% leased out. So it seems like that has not been a barrier to leasing the building. And the way that we think about it is in the value of increased productivity for our people. So um, there's, there's a lot of studies showing between one and 10% benefit of productivity increase in a you know, high performance biophilic environment for, um, for office workers. And for us, if we get a one to 2% benefit, that's more than the value of our increased rent. People are about 75% of our costs. And so, so it's a really powerful number. At the same time, for uh, retention and recruiting, both of those are actually really expensive for a business. And this building helps us retain our staff. It has literally kept people here that have had other offers. And in the end, we've decided because of all the excitement around this building to stay. Similarly, it has helped us recruit people. Um, so you know, it works for both of those. And, and finally, for a mission aligned firm, there is a, you know, there's a brand building development also. To be in a project like this. So um, that's also really important. But all of that together, we saw you know, that there was, there was value in the, uh, the extra cost that, that outweighed what those costs were. Um, so just oh, animations are very slow, um, but a little section cut of the building. Uh, so five floors, you can see, you can see the rating floors. We have heat, uh, heat recovery ventilators on a floor by floor basis. Uh, also really try to prioritize uh, indoor environmental quality. The um, rooftop solar provides about half of the solar for our building. There is uh, another solar array that we funded as a donation to the REACH Affordable Housing Project that was happening at the same time in Kenton uh, that provides the other half of our renewable energy as additional solar on the grid. We have a, um, an agreement with REACH, REACH where we get the renewable energy credits, they get the power. So it actually has a, an equity benefit um, for this project for the community also. You can see the diagram of our cistern here also, 70,000 gallon cistern under the building. And uh, so as we go up to the top floor, um, this is kind of our community gathering space in the building, big windows that open up, uh, lots of elements of biophilia in here that people have really been enjoying. Uh, and then looking at the SB4A framework, you know, it's interesting uh, thinking about the, uh, the way that different projects um, approach this. You know, we are in tier one uh, with regard to certifications uh, with the LBC certification, assuming that we make it through our performance period, which we expect to. Uh, at the same time, the COVID contracts was not something that we prioritized uh, going into this project mostly because of the developer-led performance. We had such a tight target to try and hit that um, 
our our approach was to go to the contractors that we had really good working relationships with and uh, and engage and engage them. So it was um, not something that we um, yeah that we included. I guess as a specific project goal. Uh, the public art uh, that we have downstairs, I think, uh, hits a lot of the public art uh, requirements to get us to tier one. Uh, the affordable rents, as I mentioned, were actually the premium to make, again, that uh, the developer-led pro forma work. Uh, and then community engagement, I think we would have scored it at tier three. I think we did pretty good here. We engaged Old Town a lot early on and talked to them about how to make this board really fit in and benefit the neighborhood. Uh, the thing I think if we we're going to do it again that I would try for is engaging the Native American community earlier. Um, we did engage that community as we started to explore the lobby part, and we probably could have started that um, earlier in the design process. And then as far as incentives go and what really would have helped our project, um, you know, we received ETO incentives, we received an Oregon uh, Renewable Energy Development Grant, um, and all of those were helpful and really important for our performa again to make that project work. The Oregon uh, Renewable Energy De Development Grant was the Department of Energy grant that is a competition. And that's the one thing I would say is that the, the competition piece means you have to be far enough along in design to know that you know you can get it funded. And I think that um, it makes it harder to be as impactful in a pro forma. So Things for us like knowing uh, system development charges could be um, reduced or eliminated, uh, permitting, uh, uh, expedited permitting would have been a, a big help for us. The uh, additional height for FAR may or may not have, we would have had to figure out at five stories, we're pretty close to the limits of our, how much water we can really capture to be able to use within the building. So for a living building, that one might have been a little bit tricky. But I think for us, really, those financial pieces early on that um, you know we could have really counted on would have been the thing that would have moved the needle most for us. And that's that's it for me. Awesome! Thanks so much, Mark. And stop sharing if I can't hear. There we go. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. You have stopped sharing. Okay, so we'll turn it over to Alex. All right, thank you. Um, very amazing projects. Um, so my name is Alex Botzel. I'm with a company called Greenhammer. Uh, here in Portland, Oregon, we design, build, and we are focusing on um, uh, uh, small multifamily, uh, single family, and small commercial projects. And I, I have the opportunity to um, now show you actually a couple of our projects that are um, uh, probably on the outer um, edges of what this program uh, will support, but it's interesting to understand how it could do that. And so to start that, um, um, I wanted to talk about the New Day uh, School, which is in Southeast Portland, um, Oregon's first zero energy preschool. But I have to say, I, I looked a little bit around. I don't think there's another one in the country, but you know, like we're thinking, they're thinking this is a good claim for the school. Um, and in terms of, uh, the goals, right? So it's, you know, as a preschool um, and it's an old building, you know, the owners and, and operators really were wanted to, you know, like a, a rehab was overdue. So this is an existing building and this is a great rehab and it was overdue. And they really um, were looking into the goals that they were, were hoping to, um, to align with the philosophy of the school, um, which is, you know, they're following uh, neo-humanism principles, which really means that besides accepting all humans, they really like want it to be in, in line or in harmony with all living beings, which, you know, really to having a, to lower the footprint as much as possible, like was very much in line with, with their values. So this is the campus. There's, uh, there was a phase one originally, um, a tilt up a concrete building that we did some modest energy upgrades to. And then the project really we're talking today about is phase two. Uh, it's called the Kishile building, um, their, main, their main classroom building. So the way we approach, you know, like zero energy projects and energy efficiency is, you know, we conserve energy first, right? So reducing the, the loads um, uh, to get to a point where we can actually offset on site 
uh, reasonable with a reasonable size PV array. So in this case, we actually optimized the anvil, we built airtight, we added insulation. So principles that are you know like akin to the passive house standard, which one of the board members um, has lived in a passive house home, and so they brought that to us and said like, uh, you know, Green Hammer is uh, known to to use those principles to get to these um, results. And so besides energy efficiency, there's also resilience benefits that we will see. But we basically optimized the light as well and kind of the flow in the building uh, so that we get both like a daylit uh, classroom building, but that also is inviting yet secure. So once we reduce loads, you know, through passive measures like the uh, insulation, which there was none in the existing building, um, then now we're looking at efficient HVAC. And what's interesting here is um, we focused here on on um, uh, the building, whole building ventilation, right? So we have a, a rooftop unit that does, um, uh, um, you know, like 100% outside air um, by 80 to 85% recovery rate, which means we're really recovering most of our conditioned air or energy uh, and have like very minimal that we need to add to the building. So you see like in that corner, uh, like residential style or size ductless mini splits. So a few of those heads actually um, are sufficient to condition the building and it's tested now, you know, through the recent heat wave uh, last winter. Um, so they're super comfortable. And um, the idea is of the ventilation system actually has them, you know, we're still waiting on results where we're, we're actually we're tracking absentees before the remodel. And we were hoping to do an analysis after the remodel if there's any changes. Obviously with COVID that's really difficult because they were closed, they had like smaller um, classroom sizes, but what they could say that since they reopened, they didn't have a single COVID case. Um, and they're anecdotally probably, they anecdotally assume that absentee rates have gone down too compared to prior to the remodel. So that I think is the biggest success in this, um, um, but we will really uh, interested in waiting to see if we can show that up with more concrete numbers. The other aspect is the building also went all electric, right? So there was a gas furnace before, but the idea is to really offset 100% of the impact. The building wanted to go all electric. So it's uh, besides heat pump space heating, it's also heat pump water heating that's utilized in this building. Here's some modeling results. Um, so we basically reduced the EOI around 50%, but what's even, I think, a, 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 a almost more important aspect you know, like we, we understand zero energy, we understand we can, you know, like what we need to do to make our projects zero energy with onsite generation. But, but the, the interesting takeaway here is that the winter peak was reduced by 80%, right? So when we do the next step really into like having our zero energy projects harmonize with the grid, we have to look for those peak loads. And besides energy efficiency and resilience, uh, passive measures um, like, you know, passive house principles, can reduce those loads in winter um, dramatically that makes it a, a lot easier for the utility to, to, to manage those difference in loads to summer and winter. Uh, here were the goals again that, you know, like what's important to the owners, safe and secure, sustainable and resilient, serene and uplifting, and a beacon of hope. So they really uh, see themselves at like a, as like a community um, center and, and a refuge for for times and you know that that um, these kids can be secure and healthy, right? Which we've seen again, like with the smoke, wildfire smoke, they really could like uninterrupted uh, teaching through like all uh, weather conditions. Solar and storage, you see, uh, that's a forty-five uh, kilowatt array that obviously operates much more than the Kishley building on the left itself. It actually um, allow us the entire campus to be zero energy now. Um, and, and there's storage attached to it as well. Like, so there's batteries, I think two batteries each, uh, three KWs and um, besides lighting, so safety lighting, uh, it runs a refrigerator. So if there's anything that needs to be maintained, refrigerated like medication or things like that, that's an option. We also um, connected the HIV to the battery backup with now allows them really to fully function um, uh, even in severe conditions, right? So the even so they can't add cool heating or cooling 
And then power outage, you know, we anticipate that they would be able to um, uh, have that livable for days, um, uh, even without heating and cooling. So that was um, very interesting for us to find out. You know, and then the opportunity, you know, once you do a gut rehab, um, uh, you know, other upgrades could be um, uh, included, you know, seismic upgrades, which is was important to them. Again, like they wanted to be able to have that to be a safe community center. Now, it's not to a standard that it would be, uh, you know, uh, people can re-enter, but at least it's upgraded from the standard that it fulfilled or barely fulfilled in when it was built in 59. So now it's up to standards and um, everybody feels a little better about it. Uh, backup battery, um, you know, like extreme weather I mentioned, ventilation and smoke I mentioned. These are all things that are critical for um, all of us. So not just the schools, but homes and office buildings. Um, water sense, you know, fixtures, you know, reduce indoor water use, which was, uh, which was an easy one for us to achieve. They have some food production on site. Um, and then again, it's a, it's a community shelter. So what's important to know, it is a, it is a, pri a preschool. So safety is a concern. So in terms of public access, obviously that's limited. Um, there are having community events after hours. And as a whole, I think through the parent and teacher interaction, I think uh, is when they can, you know, uh, the, the, the experience of a space that's uh, like this um, hopefully carries into the community so people understand what's feasible today. Financial support, you know, there were a, a PGE grant for the, for the solar array, energy trust incentives, as we mentioned before, and then parent contributions like made up the rest so that this large PV array actually could be final, uh, uh, financed. So, uh, in, you know, we talked about indoor air quality, but besides the, besides the ventilation system, which is critical, um, um, there's the lights and views, non-toxic material, which you can see the kids are in contact with, you know, the floor and, and other aspects. So we really wanted to make sure that they can't pick up any toxic from finishes, uh, filtered water. You know, on the left, you might see that bottle filler that's, uh, you know, that's accessible to the kids at any time and biophilic design, which, you know, hopes to stimulate, uh, you know, the learning process and connect, you know, learning principles to experienced, to the uh, experience of the environment. An interesting opportunity here because it's a, it's a gut rehab is really the, the, the reuse, right? So there was a careful analysis uh, that we uh, uh, made to begin with to like, what was there to keep and what do we need to change? So we opted to actually keep the slab and the foundation system and the existing framing, um, which you know obviously is like a huge opportunity and a huge reduction in the carbon footprint, particularly if you would have had to replace the concrete that would have been uh, dramatic. So this is really a case for uh, rehabbing our buildings. There are so many small commercial buildings that, that are in Portland and in Oregon, and an opportunity to upgrade to these levels, I think would be um, you know, better understanding what it would take um, and how to get there, I think is important because it is feasible. Uh, that's probably also where in terms of incentives, um, I think an important aspect is uh, the support of the municipality in terms of permitting you know, and understanding these systems and making these changes and really helping um, you know, like a building owner to, to, to bring an existing buildings into the 21st century. Um, FSC Lumber Forest Judicial Council, that's kind of a, what we try to, you know, at Greenhammer, we try to foster for all construction, right? So sustainable lumber that allows us to actually um, keep some of the sequestered carbon in the forest floor, um, you know, more likely in sustainable managed forests than in, in you know, like if you have a clear cut, you typically can prevent that sequestered carbon from emitting. And so there's really a chain um, that plays a role and um, carbon is important for us. Reuse is, in, is, is critical and you will see in some of the other projects, what other opportunities we have to reduce and body carbon. So yeah, here's, here's you know, essentially our takeaways. Um, we have to commit to zero energy early on, right? So it's it's really critical that design decisions on day one are made with it with that in, in goal, uh, with an end goal in mind. 
uh, it's important to have a team, you know, that trusts each other so that we can um, we can point out challenges and 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 obstacles early on and see how to best overcome them. A big one for us, passive measures, you know, like we're feeling like there's, there's an added benefit now with resilience uh, that becomes going to become more and more critical in all electric. Again, the opportunity to be um, exceptionally efficient and uh, able to offset 100% renewably. Okay, so this was project number one. Um, let me stop and share next. So the next one is a single family residence. All right. Now we can see my screen. Can you see my second presentation? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So the Richmond residence um, really set out to, uh, besides the zero energy goal, to also uh, even more aspirational goal, zero water goal. Uh, so this is a young uh, couple that really wanted to understand like how to minimize the footprint and, and how to live as, you know, like as you know, with a low impact as possible, um, but yet not forego uh, some of the benefits um, that that could bring. So the key piece here for us is, um, that we feel like an efficient design um, really makes a small, makes for a smaller footprint. We, it's not uncommon that we have single family clients who come to us with an understanding of like the, all the space they need, they you know, add up their space requirements and, and get to, a, you know, like often twice as much square footage that they feel is necessary than it actually has to. So this one is 79 square feet, two bedroom, two bathroom. And in addition, you know, like, you know what we what we might be foregoing on in amenities on the in the interior. You know, like really by activating exterior spaces, uh, uh, the quality of life uh, increases, and we have a you know the connection to nature. Again, concrete. So in this case, you know, I, I show a few of the um, uh, the the principles that go behind uh, what we typically do with all our projects. So we are working with local. Uh, contract suppliers to identify, okay, what is what are opportunities to reduce carbon even further in concrete? We know, you know, typically single family and most of our small multifamily construction is still wood frame. Uh, we use cellulose uh, uh, insulation, so both very low uh, carbon intensive products. Concrete really remains our biggest um, contributor to um, embodied carbon. Uh, so we're focused on that and we have some made some good inroads. So like in, in this case, this the uh, compared to uh, traditional carbon, concrete mixes probably reduce the body carbon by 50% on this one. Um, and then, you know, we mentioned that before, airtight construction, bone insulation is much more effective in exterior insulation to add, you know, um, an envelope and enclosure that really allows this project to reduce their loads and be resilient in, in severe uh, weather, weather winds. Triple pane windows, advanced framing, all these parts, you know, like of our toolbox to improve um, the loads in the building. In this case, um, we also um, actually exceeded our goal um, in, in COVID contracts. So BIPOC and minority owned, we have always faced, always, um, try to improve our, um, our contracting amount with minority-owned businesses, but really have started measuring like a year ago. Um, and we kind of set our goal to 25%. Uh, that seemed to be reasonable for us to start out with. In this project, we actually were able to achieve 33% um, contracting with minority businesses. And um, the, the opportunity here really is that some of those systems that we're utilizing are not common. And so in, in working with, with um, trade partners, you know, like we learn, we learn both ways, right? So some of our trade partners are new to the assemblies that we're in and the products that we're using. And so they're um, understand those better and hopefully be able to apply this to, to future projects. And then we learn, you know, like how to best communicate 
um, how to lower thresholds to contract with us and, and to improve communication on, you know, like what an RFI looks like and how, how to best be clear on the scope so that we'd be more successful in contracting with minority businesses. The step further here, um, the zero water, essentially the storage as you see here are three 3,000 gallon tanks that were we buried in the backyard. And then on the left is a filtration system that makes that portable. So the project is set to really supply 100% of its water use with rainwater. Um, we're not there yet because the landscape, as you can see, uh, still needs to be established. Uh, so water use is um, elevated above what we um, um, expecting. Uh, so I think next year uh, it's going to be really interesting. But um, the interesting one is we've done a few of these systems in the past, and they're obviously um, not cheap to install. Yet, um, if there would be, you know, SDC credits. Um, I think that would be an opportunity to make that more common in projects like these. As well, this project, all electric, all heat pump, right? So heat pump water heater, um, heat pump space heating. Um, we actually have some inflow heat in the basement that is also run off the water heater. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, extremely efficient, of, you know, COP of four or five that we're getting there or uh, coefficient of performance, which means we're like four to five times more efficient than a gas furnace or a gas water heater. Um, and the system operate really well. We were able to actually store those heat pump units um, away, you know, like sometimes um, they're not the most attractive, but you know, in this case, we found opportunities to kind of tuck them away. Uh, the jurisdiction, that is an interesting one. I see, you know, like on, on the right, that's uh, our site superintendent with our inspector. So we're, you know, we're, we're generally on good terms with the city, uh, definitely in the field, um, because we have systems that might be new to building officials. Um, we're as open and communicative as we can be. In this case, unfortunately, because we had on-site um, uh, uh, water treatment, uh, we had a different understanding than the city on how we isolate our system from the city, from the water system, which is through a device like this, which we placed a smaller device, a backflow preventer in the interior of the home. But what they um, eventually required after the project was done, final inspection, they required um, this backflow preventer at the property line. So there was some miscommunication, um, it could have been probably caught earlier by the city or by us for that matter, but it hasn't been. So again, this is really that, you know, just as much as like other incentives, I think the ad advocacy at the city and, and the opportunity for the city to work with um, projects that are trying new systems that might be not um, the run of the mill and understanding the obstacles and working for, uh, with them through them is I think a really, really critical aspect and could really make these projects more um, successful. And then a couple interior shots, just how it, an exterior, you know, final shots, just how it turned out. And we often say the devil's in the detail. I personally think the beauty is there as well. And um, yeah, it turned out, you know, beautiful and, and the owners are really happy. And we're slated to be zero energy and hopefully zero water by, by the next year. Okay. Um, I got one more to share with you. Um, this one is a couple of years. It's been a while. Um, uh, some, some people might have been already familiar with this. I apologize for some hiccup here. Interesting, right? Uh, well, I'm going to share it and we'll see which slides I can actually show. I really apologize. Okay, 
Hauses. Okay, it's loading and we see it and we see um, on the left kind of all your slides, but yeah. we do see this screen. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I have like um, difficulties with the slides, but um, so this is a, a 16 unit multifamily project and it's an info site. Um, on Tillamook and Williams. Uh, so it's, uh, as you can see, it kind of like has a, it's, it's in the central city. What, what's important to us is that some of these multifamily infill projects are really can serve a different need, right? We need higher density um, as opposed to single family zoning. And, and um, what is like often, um, coined the missing middle are projects that are, you know, uh, higher density, but yet um, make sense in, in the environment. And you can actually see that in the back here. That's a nice picture of the courtyard. Um, so um, uh, the interesting one here is that we've done a few of these um, and they're challenging uh, specifically for zero energy. Um, but I think it's a huge opportunity to to provide the density in the inner city that we need. And I hope that the RIP, the Resolution for Program, will make inroads into this. But, you know, I really just wanted to show what can be done. So, and I don't know why I have blank slides. Um, that's... Um, yeah, apologies. Um, I make sure I talk about you know the the important aspects. But as you can see here, this is a seventy five kilowatt array that powers the you know all of these. These are units um, from one bedroom through three bedrooms. Uh, so the idea is that there is a diversity. Um, what you see in the center here is a common house. Um, so that you know uh, that's shared. The upper floor is a gym. Um, that project has a battery. So like the, the common space has a battery. So in case of power outages, people can congregate. There's refrigeration in there. Uh, again, the same concept is that heating and cooling is not serviced by the battery, but the ventilation system. So that should allow um, fresh air and, and limit the need to like open windows, you know, uh, when it's cold uh, in case there's a, a large number of people gathering in there and some outlets to charge laptops and, and cell phones. Um, let's see, do I have more slides? Yeah, so the, um, the interesting one here is the arrangement, right? So every, um, every unit, the intention was to really have them courtyard facing uh, entrances, you know, to increase interactions between the people. So even the second story units almost feel like like an entrance to a home. So even though it's multifamily, you know, they're all exterior entrances, you know, some of them are stacked and some are side by side. Um, and the idea that, is that, uh, that there's that um, interactions so would actually happen to be um, really the case, uh, especially during COVID, the court was highly used, which was interesting to see. Um, again, windows facing to the courtyard from the kitchen as well to encourage interaction. Um, there's some uh, rainwater catchment. In this case, it's three times 1,200 gallons um, that are predominantly used for irrigation, right? It's like this community garden here that we see, but you know, it's not. It's not. Um, it would be feasible to consider the, you know, as a as a backup in case there's an emergency uh, earthquake or so that would limit um, the availability of fresh water. You know, this 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 could be filtered and used. So there's some on-site storage, that's good. Again, here's the uh, closer shot to the common house, which is used frequently for you know, meals. They actually have a, a large screen in there. So their you know, sports event and other things are, are, are shared and, and really increase the communication between the clients and the interaction there. And this is actually a shot uh, during COVID times. So you can see that the court was used um, uh, while social distancing properly, but um, it was really interesting that people basically didn't end up being isolated in their units. They were able to, to, to interact uh, still. All right, so that was the, that's the end of my slideshow. And I, I apologize that I 
couple slides didn't come through. Um, again, you know, like in terms of the incentives, uh, yes, you can might have you know gathered like uh, height bonuses or far bonuses. We typically don't max those out. Um, but SDC fees, I think, is a big one, particularly around the water piece, and then the cooperation, you know, and collaboration with the jurisdiction on these projects and system that the city might be not used to. You know, again, in the residential area, it's a different uh, culture compared to commercial and, and how to provide, you know, engineering uh, submittals and things that would make uh, that more transparent to the city. And so the goodwill by the city could probably help, you know, many more of these projects to become feasible. All right, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, and yeah, thank you to the whole group. Those projects are amazing. Uh, and it's so nice to get to see more of the detail um, in this format. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I, I see that we have some questions popping in. Please continue to drop those in um, as we go along. And one, maybe I'll just start with for the whole group. Um, so feel free to jump in where, where you'd like, if you're ready for it, or if you want to think longer. Um, but one is, was there anything that was particularly challenging for your project that the incentives that were proposed in the SB4A framework could have helped with? Um, and I'll open that up to whoever wants to jump in, but hopefully we can hear from each of you. It could kick us off. Um, so for the PAD living building, I think, you know, um, given our performa and trying to do this with the developer, you know, we had a really tight window that we could hit of, you know, we had to balance what's the lease rate that, you know, the, the market would accept, the bank would actually underwrite, and then what's the, you know, what was the return that our investors wanted. And, so that was that was a really small window. I think, um, yeah, it, you know, any kind of, and, and so, and then I, I had mentioned in my in my presentation the low interest rates was one of the things that really helped us. And so that obviously we're now in an increasing interest rate environment. So I think having additional funding help or you know or um, rebates of uh, you know expenses like STC charges would probably have been the, the most impactful thing to be able to, you know, help us replicate a building like this again now in this higher interest rate environment. We need a little bit more on the, uh, that funding side so that the performance all works. Yeah, I'll echo yeah. that same thing, or maybe you're going to say the same thing, Jennifer. SDC charges, affordable housing is not affordable to build. There's a lot of hurdles to jump through. Um, and particular funding packages require a lot of things, which is good most of the time. But uh, that bottom line really helps us meet meet a lot of the goals that we have. Uh, the SDC charges really would have helped. And Jennifer did mention for this particular project, the floor to floor height, um, just an extra couple of feet would have really helped um, the units feel a little taller, uh, let, let more light in, uh, solved a couple of other issues that we had to work around. Were you going to add anything else, Jen? Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, from our perspective, again, we, we're not maxing out the site, but I think, you know, since we're um, struggling more and more with density and, and, and housing units, I think that's important. Um, and we also have to connect some of these incentives to those affordable units, because obviously if um, certain projects get, you know, fees waived, they have to come from somewhere else. Um, same if you say like, you know, expedited permitting, I think is a, is an excellent tool, but that probably means that other projects have to go to the back of the line. And, and so I think it, it's important that the project, you know, meets other goals to make that feasible to everyone. But, but I think it's critical also to show like what technology is possible these days already, uh, because we don't have cases like these that we can share. Uh, people will, you know, probably falsely still think that, you know, being zero energy, for example, um, or living building certified, that that is still so far out of reach. Um, and so I think it's going to help to make that more 
uh, popularized, but I think we, you know, we have to make sure that we have a good balance. Great, thank you all. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, and really echoes a lot of what we heard throughout this whole long process of developing this framework uh, is ways to reduce those upfront soft costs as much as possible. Um, so this question I'll post to Jennifer and Jake. Um, and really it's, it's kind of broad, so answer as you see fit, but really just kind of how did you plan for the community engagement part of the project? Um, and then within that, were there any particular things you heard from the community that were integrated into the project? Um, Jennifer, I know you mentioned parking earlier, but if anything else kind of comes to mind. Yeah, we, um, you know, we had a plan for the community engagement process um, from the inception of the project and never imagined the project would take so long to get moving um, and get to the final design phase. So we did, um, you know, reassess that plan as we went along and worked with Hacienda and Living Coley um, along the way. You know, the Adelitas project had the benefit of being a part of Hacienda's broader campus. So we had a built-in resident group that we were able to rely on and really um, work with throughout. And then Coley as a neighborhood has a really strong um, participation group. So um, it really had some advantages that other locations may not have. Um, I think the parking is something we heard about. Um, the mid-block crossing um, on Killingsworth was really important to the neighborhood, um, knowing that there would be so many kids and families crossing that street and um, relying on either end of the very long block. Um, just, they were like, it's not feasible, it's not gonna happen. So um, that was a push all the way through and um, working with PBOT, PBOT kind of had a separate project running that started after ours. And um, so that is moving forward. Um, the importance of art in the plaza space were also really driven by the community. And you mentioned the unit finishes as well are directly a result of those sessions. Yeah, they wanted dark finishes so you didn't see the fingerprints. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Mark, for you, I'm going to jump to this question that I know you already answered, but uh, just so that it's on the record uh, for the recording. Um, but the question was, can you talk a bit more about your offsite renewables? And is that a part of your energy pedal? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the answer uh, is yes, the offsite renewables were needed to get to net zero energy for our building. And ILFI recognized that as a um, as an avenue to, to do it because we had a utility constraint. So we're in uh, the the downtown PGE network, and just the way that the grid is put together, we couldn't net meter as much as we wanted to in our building. We would have needed to net meter about 300 kW total to meet all of our energy needs. We could net meter about 50 only at site. Uh, and then we had another constraint from the, uh, the design commission because we're in Old Town. Uh, there's a rule that you can't have any PV visible from the sidewalk, essentially. So just it's not a character of the neighborhood. And, uh, and the city was really firm on that, which meant that all of our PV had to be tight to the roof. It's about three feet off the roof, so you can't see it set back from the edge of the roof so that there's a fire department walk aisle. So we have three feet all the way around our building and then through the middle of the PV also. So our roof is about 75% covered with PV. And uh, yeah, and the, the donated array is, it's a 215 kW array. So it's about 60% of our total power was donated to reach. It runs their meter backwards and then we get those credits. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking, Amanda, about uh, you know, other things that would have helped us. That was actually a harder thing to arrange to you know, make that donation than we would have thought it would have been. And you know, it's partially just because you know, you're, you're dealing with different people at, at REACH. They had a few project managers that had kind of cycled through the job. So it was hard to get that continuity. And if there was a program 
through you know the city of Portland connecting uh, you know projects that want to hit net zero that maybe can't do it on site with uh, affordable housing projects that are looking to add PV um, that you know there could be sort of a matchmaking and then maybe a sharing of that burden so that you know the project maybe doesn't incur the whole thing maybe part part of it's through PCEF ETO grants uh, maybe PGE the affordable housing everyone could kind of pull together and you could maybe start to accelerate um, projects getting to net zero through this community sharing. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And that's, um, yeah, a really interesting idea to think through how um, local governments can help kind of make those connections and help everyone kind of get where we're all wanting to head. So yeah, that's great. Um, Alex, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned um, that Green Hammer's now been doing a lot of work with setting um, your own targets for uh, contracting with minority businesses, as well as uh, sort of identifying any thresholds to contracting with you all um, that folks are running into. And I'm wondering if there's anything in particular you found in that process um, that you've heard from folks that has kind of impacted how um, you do that contracting. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. It, it is really interesting as we go through the motions, right? So first we we set a goal and then we started tracking and then we, uh, we were like, okay, okay, we have projects we're doing well and we have projects we're doing less well. Overall, we met our goal last year, but then we realized um, we the number of bids from uh, certified um, contractors was you know significantly lower. And so we started to like, okay, we're using a, an electronic platform for bids. And we're like, okay, maybe there's a hurdle there, is there a language hurdle or like some others. So we actually actively reached out um, and did more analysis and then realized that we get the same response rate from um, COVID certified contractors as we get from average contractors. So that was interesting. So what we realized it really has to do, um, who do we send bids out and, and ask, um, and asked to bid to begin with, right? So um, we realized, okay, we need to uh, we need to work on our um, you know on our rolodex essentially have a larger uh, really be really active, and we've since then been active with uh, Latino Build and some other organizations to actively recruit you know to get more people in in our rolodex so we can actually reach out to more because it seems like. Um, the, the willing to bid on our projects is the same, right? So that was an interesting observation. Um, we, we also wanted to kind of lower the hurdle where it might seem that what Greenhammer does is too, you know, like it's more advanced. So that might be complications to like actually respond to the level of work that, that we might be um, looking at again, you know, with Latino Build, we're hoping to have, you know, some green building educational events together to kind of lower you know, the, the fear to dive into this and maybe hopefully see that as an asset, um, being able to deliver these projects. So we're still in the middle of it. Um, you know, like we're we're excited about the, the the original entry, you know, like the original findings, but I think in the single family residential world, which is really most of our contractors, that um, the eye isn't as, um, as schooled in identifying these issues, you know, it's more like commercial, where like there might be requirements um, on uh, public projects or things like that. And it's a new in our um, neck of the woods, so to speak. Um, but we're interested, and and so far we've seen some positive responses, and we're we're glad that we're identifying um, opportunities for us to reach out more. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, good lessons learned there for folks to, to think about. Um, and so I think we hopefully have time to, to do one more question a piece. Um, so Jennifer and Jake, back to you all. Um, Jennifer, you had mentioned that originally your goal was gold earth advantage, um, but now you're on track for platinum. And so I'm wondering from the two of you, um, what kind of helped you make that leap? And are there any kind of interesting, innovative credits that you pursued with Earth Advantage that um, helped you get there as well? I presume I'm taking this one. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we were on, tra on track for a high tier of gold. Like we were 
we were within striking distance from the beginning. Um, so we worked with uh, Earth Advantage to see what other credits we might be able to pursue. Um, we pushed our energy goals a little higher, which was feasible from the contractor on our end. Um, and the innovative credits that you mentioned, we uh, worked with them discussing our community engagement process, which was an emerging goal for Earth Advantage and uh, a credit that they've been applying on other projects. Um, and they were able to give us a few points based on our our thesis or ethos for the project in general, just reaching out to the community and really making them a part of the process um, gave us a few extra points that we needed. So we are now on track for platinum um, because we were so close already and we're able to get a few credits that we didn't uh, know we could get and um, able to push the envelope a little further so to speak on others awesome thank you yeah it's great to hear um that was kind of any of these third-party certifications that are in the program that they're really creating that opportunity for innovation and to kind of build in some of these things that might not be included. So that's great. Um, Mark, over to you. Did you run into any permitting issues with the water systems in your building? Um, or maybe kind of more broadly, is there anything that, that could be helpful with those processes in the future? Yeah, there were, there were a few issues with regard to um, think back think the gray water system the way that it was sized sort of fit only within residential code and so we had to we had to go back and forth a bit with the city of portland to kind of figure out you know what is it that we were doing we actually ended up um, taking the, uh, the city plumbing inspector up to the bullet center to show him the systems there that we wanted to install and that helped sort of you know helped him understand what it is that we were trying to do um, and from there to there, it was actually, it was relatively smooth. We have our permits now for our drinking water system uh, for the composting system, all of that's in place at this point now. Um, so it was, it was, to be honest, it was, there were less barriers than I expected going into it. Um, but yeah, again, I think some sort of expedited permitting or, you know, a, a, someone to help sort of translate maybe the living building requirements and you know um, just kind of help guide that conversation a little bit when it helped it start a little smoother it was just a little bit rocky at the beginning great thank you um and alex one final question then i uh, we probably have to turn it over to ante for closing um but another question for you um is did the project, and I'm, I'm talking about Richmond residents here, although I think you were talking about low carbon concrete more broadly too, but did the project or have any of your projects faced any cost premium for low carbon concrete? Or are you, how are you starting to see that show up in the market? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question because um, um, the, the supplier that we reached out to begin with, you know, who's really committed to the cause and Besides lowering uh, the carbon and body carbon and product, they're offsetting the remainder, you know, with offsets. So they're really committed to the cause, and they're basically assured us, okay, there's cost parity to like the concrete mix compared to traditional ones. Well, but however, um, now you have to match the um, contractor, right, the trade partner, to the supplier, which is not always the case, right? So. For example, in this case, we had a we had a, already a partner under contract who get volumes volume discounts at a different supplier. So now there was a net increase, so to speak, in material, which we didn't anticipate. Um, I think, however, those hurdles can be overcome as like there's more suppliers who offer these um, kind of um, mixes. I think what's critical is to um, really bring the plant into the conversation because a lot of our experiences that trade partners have their set mixes that they are comfortable with. Um, even though a lot of them, uh, the low carbon mixes perform very similar or like the learning curve is very minimal. Um, obviously there's some, there's a lot of apprehension from trade partners. So working together to lower those, uh, for example, um, there were our contractor at the Richmond residence we're comfortable with stem walls and foundation, but not flat work. So we ended up um, actually 
pouring the slab that got flooring cut floor coverings in the basement first for them to gain experience. So we staged the project slightly different. Um, so I think there's just you know good communication and and making sure that your trade partners understand what you're after and that doesn't necessarily mean um, a different process, um, but maybe just slightly and just getting used to do that. Um, and just for example, one thing is we are like standard. Um, we always ask for EPDs now on on many products, really just to reinforce that language. You know, like we want these EPDs to understand. You know, even though many products don't have EPDs yet, but we want our our uh, suppliers to ask the uh, question to their suppliers, so that we really get that conversation going more often. So there's a bit, little bit of a learning curve that translates into a cost increase right now. But I think if it's with the right partner early on, it doesn't necessarily need to to be the case. Awesome. Thanks for that. It's really helpful to learn. Um, and Ante, I think we we'll turn it over to you now. Yeah, let me just say one more time, thank you to all our presenters today, uh, hearing about these awesome projects. It's because um, I'm calling up my uh, last slide. It says, you know, there's a lot of market interest in um, addressing these issues that all these projects are tackling, whether it's the health and how schools can function in <laughs> dangerous times and how we do better for our affordable housing up to our market rate office buildings. Uh, but there is just a good reminder, there's a lot of market interest in buildings. So as we don't, I think part of why sustainable building for all is envisioned is like, we don't wanna miss the opportunity on any of these building projects that if you have, as you build the buildings that are gonna be our environment and our neighborhoods for the next hundred years, hopefully we want them to be as sustainable as possible. Um, I hope for, for people who join us today, you learned about projects you didn't know about before. And, and now you know that we are building these really deeply sustainable projects in Portland and around the country. Uh, and I think you'll you also heard um, building any building is challenging from, from trade partner relationships to financing. And so an incentive framework is, is a nudge. It helps move things forward, but it's definitely not um, and not intended to be a, a magic bullet um, that's kind of at a scale beyond what's envisioned here. And we also think that through some of the issues you've heard today and some of the things we've included in the sustainable business for all framework, you, you can start to think of maybe other policies or programs that cities, towns, counties, and states, and even the federal government can do that help support some of these outcomes. I think some of the things of even like tax credits that require holding buildings for long times so, uh, that can have a positive impact on the payback decisions around some of these things. And so, and then to you, our, our attendees today, I also wanted to thank you um, for your time. And we are going to make this webinar recording, along with our others, available through this webpage uh, shown on screen that I believe Amanda had dropped into the chat earlier. Um, so you should be able to scroll up and get it. And if you have any follow up questions or, or want to know more, please reach out to Amanda uh, at her email address listed here and check out our page uh, or Oregon DEQ's page where that highlights um, a lot of those initiatives going on in the state of Oregon. Amanda, any, any final words? No, just uh, I'll just reiterate a huge thank you to all the attendees and um, also to all of our speakers. Uh, thank you for being here today, for sharing your awesome projects and for really help helping pave the way with a lot of this really innovative work. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.